Educate, entertain, enjoy. You're listening to Aspen Weight Radio. This is Outstanding Paul. Let's hope he's outstanding with Claire Anderson Bell today, who is my lovely guest, resplendent in your lovely hair there, Claire. I'm glad to see. Hello, thank you. <laughs> Yes, so um, anybody that uh, has a brand called Nude uh, has my undivided attention. Uh, so true story, this. Um, when I presented the um, Thames Valley and Southwest Business Awards, up came Nude Skin on the graphics. And uh, uh, as I have a, a very mucky mind, it was uh, too much for me, to be honest with you, Claire. <laughs> anyway, so um, I think um, Claire's story is going to be quite inspirational today uh, in terms of um, how... Uh, nude came to be formed in the first place um, and very much her her um, sort of ethical approach to business and all the things uh, I was talking earlier about the fact that uh, we as human beings um, really let ourselves down in the way we treat animals and and all that sort of thing so I'm a huge opponent of of um, testing on animals you know particularly monkeys etc so I'm very pleased to see um you taking such a strong stand and I do think um, an increasing number of people really respect that and um, you know want to buy from people like you so um, to start off with we're going to find out um, how did Claire Anderson Bell get to be Claire Anderson Bell today so um, tell us a bit about so where were you where where were you born Claire? Um, I was born in Newmarket in Suffolk near oh, Cambridge. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah one of my, my best friend at university lived in Leaders Way in Newmarket yeah yeah the horse racing capital isn't it yeah absolutely um yeah probably yeah and also um lots of good places to get drunk in from what i remember yeah there was oh, there was <laughs> is that is that has it got worse is it yeah no it's not it's not the nightclub in town it used to be but it's still cool <laughs> i used to still like going to newmarket and obviously as a big horse racing um fan newmarket as you say is um effectively the capital of flat racing of course cheltenham is the capital of jump racing yeah um so um what, what, what did your parents do what sort of um you know what family did you come from um a horsey family my dad was really? a jockey. yeah your dad was a jockey <laughs> yeah what was his yeah. name uh, lenny anderton so what? he um yeah he was a jockey back in the day now he still works with um horses he's he box drives to and from races and stuff like that and worked for Henry Cecil. So and my mum was um, a groom and bowling mares and stuff like that. So we're very horsey. I think I was a black sheep. My brother and sister are riding instructors and my really? brother's a farrier in Australia. So it's just me that's into skincare and entrepreneur. <laughs> so your father worked for Henry Cecil? Yeah. Yeah, How for a long years? time. Did he work for um, Judy Cecil afterwards or...? Um... He was with Henry Cecil when it was Julie Cecil as well, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And Natalie, yeah. yeah, my favourite, my favourite racehorse trainer. So. Uh, yeah, he's lovely. Yeah, did he ever get to look after Frankel or get anywhere close to him? Do you know? Probably, probably. <laughs> you have to find out for me. Yeah. Just, uh, just to humour Paul. So, um, <laughs> grew up in a lovely environment in in um, Newmarket in a horsey family. Yeah. So, um, what? Uh, but you're not a horsey person yourself, particularly. No. So, um, what sort of things did you enjoy at school? I was very. Um, I liked art, and I was very creative. I wasn't the most academic of people, um, but I always knew I wanted to. I wanted to be in business, even from really? the age of eleven. I was playing business and writing up business directories and stuff like that. You know, like playing, trying to get my friends to join in they didn't have the same interest <laughs> where do you think that came from no idea no idea that's funny that um uh i i do a, a show on fridays for great british expos and um on friday it was my it was it was our, it was aspen Wake's 28th birthday on friday and uh, i often get asked um you know where where does my entrepreneurialness come from and the fact of it is is that i am completely different to everyone else in my family i'm just it's like everyone said you know where did paul come from and they still say that now for different reasons of course um so i can very much identify with um with that it's just obviously something in you and um and uh, it's sort of it's like a fire isn't it and you yeah. um that's the best way of putting it yeah it doesn't um, have to be any particular business i just enjoy business i think it's the freedom and the opportunities that could come your way if you're in control of it if you're mm -hmm. in the race 
So um, you you started sort of dallying uh, with business and you started having this notion that you were going to go into business when you were 11. So what was the first sort of real experience of taking that forward? You know, how old were you? Uh, I, for instance, uh, started selling plums when I was eight, um, uh, which is my first entrepreneurial experience. So uh, what was your sort of breakthrough business moment? Um, I would always try and make my mum and my dad pay for their cups of tea whenever I had to make them. <laughs> and created a, a family kitchen into a cafe, but they weren't Fantastic. quite happy about that. So that was probably my first that's my brilliant. first clue. <laughs> yeah. What about, what about outside of the? Um, yes, yeah, so I think that's. Uh, I think we can definitely say you're cheeky and opportunistic, which is one of my <laughs> opportunistic is one of my favourite words to be honest. Um, so what were you? What were your? What were your? Um, so I see you've got some, some very interesting skills, you know, in terms of what you've got down in terms of um, business development, accounting, graphic design. Um, so did you sort of choose businessy subjects when you, as soon as you could? Uh, no, we didn't really have those opportunities when we were at, when, when I was at school, we, okay. it wasn't really like that. It was, I think that came a couple of years after you could choose business studies and stuff before it was, for me, it was English, French history. You know, when I left school, I went into media makeup. What does that mean? Um, like makeup for film and in, and oh, really? yeah photography and stuff but that didn't that didn't last too long why did you do that i did that in cambridge yeah why why though oh. given that you were a businessy person what made you go into media makeup i liked makeup i think i was 16 <laughs> at school liked makeup so that was a nice little opportunity and i liked the makeup kit that it came with <laughs> oh, okay so, so um you, you had a dalliance with that but it didn't last very long yeah no no that wasn't that wasn't my career i liked plonking about in um, theatres and stuff and feeling fabulous and <laughs> but that didn't last very long at all my um I then went into um holistic therapy so aromatherapy oh, okay, and stuff cool. like that so which is probably why I've ended up where I have now yeah. um yeah and that that led me to then be a self-employed masseuse which left me self-employed for quite a few years so are you a trained aromatherapist yeah uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, both uh, you're into that sort of thing, Drew, as well, aren't you? Mm, fancy, yeah, very it? much. Uh, um, Drew and I are very, um, what do you say, nature-driven people, I would say. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yes, well, it is, yeah. So, um, yeah, so we're, de we're, we're definitely all singing from the same hymn sheet here. <laughs> um, so um, so you're a self-employed masseuse, and how many years did you do that for? I did that for 17 years. 17 years yeah on and off that always kept me going so i moved to tenerife and um wow. set up a little massage out there and um i was also doing bar work and stuff out there you know living the life when i was younger but massage and aromatherapy and reflexology always was in my background paying my bills whenever i needed it to so did you did you go to tenerife so you could party yes definitely and be naughty and things and drink yeah, too it's much great and... But I did miss my duvet. By winter, I was really missing being cold and putting a coat on and wrapping up. Yeah. So it lasted a year. That was great fun. It was time to come home. Okay. So when did you meet your husband and where did you meet him? Wife. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, in in Bury St Edmunds, in a restaurant, I, I ended up opening up a sausage mash and burlesque restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, and she was my chef. Okay. Yeah. So yes. that's so there, as, as Paul being very politically incorrect there. So uh, just to show you shouldn't assume things, should you? Especially <laughs> if you're going to interview somebody live on the radio. So um, it's fine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, 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 so how many years have you been together now? Uh, 11. 11 years. Yeah. Um, so um, so your daughter is how long? How old? She's 13. OK, so you adopted her, did you? No, I um, met Millie's dad oh, okay. um, through a friend that I met in Tenerife, and we oh, did okay. we did we did get together and we were we were together and um, ended up being more family love than um, husband wife love. So okay, um, we're still bestest of friends and very close. So it's all it's all very lovely. Oh, it is. Well, it is from Millie's point of view, I guess. Yeah, yes, for all of us. I mean, Jodie and Adam are still great friends. They. We'll have Christmases together and stuff. It's very, very lovely. Good. Yeah. So, um, 
so you came back from Tenerife. What did you do? What did you do then? I went into a care home and ran a care home for really? a little bit. Yeah. How, I think how you can just they let you do that then? Mind. Sorry. Oh, I said, yeah, that's quite a, quite an onerous position to be given, really. So they must have um, saw something, or seen something in you. Yeah, I I think um, with my holistic therapy background and you know the health driven mindset that I have anyway, and my managerial skills. Um, it, it was a pretty good fit. You know, there was a great team of carers that carried out um, their day-to-day -day tasks and I managed managed it, which was which was great. Was what, sort of, um, what sort of, um, you know, old people were in the home? Do they have, um, you know, were they confused or just a normal mix of people? Um, yeah, both. It was oh, a okay. residential care home, so they were um, they were not as confused as, you know, like a nursing home. So, yeah. And I've 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 um, uh, had clients in that sector for many many years. In fact, the first one of the first businesses I ever sold was a care home. Um, so oh. um, we're yeah work also work um, quite heavily in sort of innovation in that sector. You know, it's like the world and his wife are trying to cure Alzheimer's and uh, and that sort of thing. You know, so it's um it's like um it's like a holy grail project I call it because there is no. There, there is no cure at the moment. Yeah. So, um, you, I, I think so. Probably the care home experience was probably quite um, helpful in terms of your business development. I would think, wasn't it? It was with regards to staff and leading a team because entrepreneurial life can be quite lonely. So, um, yes. yeah, leading a team um, it did help, and so they could be. It could be good, and it could be difficult. So, yeah, they, I did take lessons away. So were you actually the boss of the care home, effectively? There was a big boss, and then I was the day-to-day, -day, you know, there was oh, like a were, team of... You were a, a medium boss, were you? Sorry? You were the medium boss. Yeah, I was the medium boss. Luckily, I don't think people would have been safe if I was the big boss. Were well, you a nice boss? Always. I don't think... I think you can get more out of your team if you're nice, supportive, caring, kind. Yeah, but do you have a firm side to you? Yeah, if, you, if I need to. Yeah, I think that's... I think that's uh, yeah, I, th I, th I think personally, um, you know, one of the, one of the things to try and do on the on the on these monthly interviews is sort of pass on uh, nuggets of wisdom to other people. Um, when I was much younger, I used to think that um, uh, staff, you know, uh, would prefer someone who was sort of kind and nice to them and all that sort of thing. But I found actually, at some great personal cost, that that isn't uh, isn't actually true. And I I, I think actually that people. Uh, much prefer strong but fair leadership. Yeah, absolutely. I think it makes them feel safer as well, knowing that you can you can take hand of any situation. That if you're strong enough, you can lead them. You can make you protect them better and stuff like that. Yeah, it's definitely kind, fair, strong. Um, when kind, fair, to... strong. Yes. <laughs> so, um, how 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 soon did nude come um, out of leaving the care home? Ten, 10 years. Gosh, you must have started when you were about six. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. I, I always say to people, I started Asper Weight when I was 13. So you seem to have done an awful lot in your life. Um... Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I have. I've, I've flitted until I find the right fit. But I think that has helped me become the person I am today. You know, I've got some war wounds, great lessons, yeah. having yeah. tried and tested a lot of different things. Um, a lot of things overlapped, like my holistic therapy and massage. That was always in the background of alongside all of these things that we're talking about mm -hmm. as well. So it makes it sound like I'm a thousand years old, but a lot of things overlapped. Okay. So um, was there was there another step between the care home and nude? Did you did you, did you do anything else before um, that? I yes, I became a buyer, which was very oh, very Lord. useful because then that it, I got my purchasing qualification and. Gosh. Learned the supply chain, and that's been invaluable. And then, um, then I had my daughter, and then I opened a sausage mash and burlesque restaurant, which was massive fun. Burlesque. Yeah. So we sold Gosh. loads of different sausages, mashes, gravies that you could mix and match. And then at weekends and evenings, we had burlesque shows, and it was just great. That sounds like your perfect place, Paul. 
Come on, mate. <laughs> sausage well, mash and burlesque. Yeah, that's amazing. It's getting there. You know, it she, was if, amazing. If Claire had said onion gravy and a few other things, I, I, I would be like, why did you stop? You know, what's going on? Where, where was this out of interest? This is in Bury St Edmunds, so near Newmarket. Oh, lovely. Yeah, I, I used to... Um, so when I when I used to go um, uh, up to Newmarket, we used to go drinking around Cambridge, etc. Yeah. Uh, and there was a drink called um, Brain Damage, which was half a pint of Abbott Ale and a bottle of Berry St Edmunds. Uh, and I remember my mate Guy telling me that no one could drink more than three pints of this. And of course, me being, you know, a, a big rugby player that's legendary for drinking, it's like this doesn't appeal. To, this this won't apply to me. And I remember I, I, I was very smug because I just finished my fourth or fifth pint and then I literally fell onto the floor asleep. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's my that's my Berry Sir Edmund story, I'm afraid. So that's a, a nice place, nice place to have it. So how did you fund all of this out of interest? Um, I had a business partner um, who was um, in costume design. So she came out of that for a while and we had friend, uh, we had family, really. We did try the banks, but family ended up wanting to support. And then um, it grew quite quickly and nicely. But it was very time consuming and it took a lot of toll on marriages and stuff, or particularly my business partner's marriage. That. Um, what the, yeah. So how many covers did you have out of interest? We had 100 at wow, any one so. time. So decent sized business, really. It was. It was... Um, yeah, it was limited. So that was my first taste of limited company life and accounts. Um, I was 28 when we started. So quite young, really, to take on such a big hmm. business. Um, but it was and, and we actually lost lots of money, even though it was it was a three week booking list. You know, it, it was in demand. But I think we were just a bit too naive, a bit too new. So it had to um yeah, we did lose actually a lot of money, even though it's extremely busy. I'd like to do it again, actually. That was it was amazing, just with the lessons I know now. So is that why you stopped doing it because you ran out of money? Or um, no, my business partner had to leave through marriage troubles because it was just taking a toll on the marriage. I think we were just tired. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it was really sad to end it, but I think we just. Yeah, we threw the towel in probably too quickly. It should have really been a chain or a franchise because it was just amazing. But I think we were just too tired, too done, too too naive. It lasted about two and a half, three years. I'm seriously yeah. impressed. I think you know, I, if I could, if I could um, salute you on on air, I would. So uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sitting there thinking this is something we've got to get into, Drew. Mm -hmm. yeah, we'd have um, sausage mash, onion gravy, and fruit ciders. How about that? Oh, yeah, yeah, rhubarb cider, mango cider. Yeah, and some sours bad, as well. They were they're, they're all, the sour ales are good, aren't they? That'd which which ales? Sours. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not really. I'm not. I'm not sure I've had many of those. Oh, they're lovely. So, uh, what sort of what sort? What do you say, sours? Have you like had a that? raspberry what? sour ale. Oh, okay. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you like that, do you? Yeah, I'm not. I like my ales. Good for you. Yeah, I've, I've, I'm a, definitely a real ale boy. Um, one of my greatest achievements is going to a pub. Um, I think it's called the Hole in the Wall in Waterloo Station and drinking uh, every pint from left to right. And then we Did play chicken on again? the end of the... Hmm? Did you fall asleep on the floor again? No, no, no. I don't usually fall asleep on the floor. I'm not, <laughs> that was uh, a special occasion. Yeah, special occasion. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. Yeah, so, so I think, I think I'll, I'll run to the hills at this point. And um, uh, Claire's first uh, music selection today is The Cave by Mumford & Sons. So yes. is music important to you? Other than burlesque, um, of course. I I love music, but I can never hear lyrics in music. I just know how it makes me feel. If, if I could possibly have a very sad song at my wedding day because I'm not mm -hmm. listening to the words, but mm -hmm. like the way the music makes me feel. So, yeah, I like music. Just don't listen to the words, which really anchors some people. But there you go. So what's special about this song? It just makes me feel great every oh. time. I just turn it up and it's just just fills me with hope, happiness and joy. Oh, 
Can't say better than that. Can we sausage from Mash and the Mumford and Sons? This, this is Full Weight on Aspen Weight Radio. Yes, that was quite uplifting, Claire. All I can think about now is sausage and mash. Um, I am getting the um, odd bit of chicken, ham and leek pie coming in as well. We did have a B-side to our menu. So the A-side the was the sausage and mash and yeah. gravy. And then we had a few different bits on the other side as well, just for those non-sausage lovers. Yeah, I think I think maybe um, sausage and mash with pie and mash would be, you know... As, yeah, as, we did have the pie, mash it. and liquor on B-side. Oh, that's very good. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. So um, where do we leave it? So um, uh, you still hadn't quite got to, to forming nude, had you? So um, you finished the. So what happened when you finished the, um, the the pie and mash business? What did you do then? Uh, back to massage and aromatherapy, and okay. yeah, back back to that. Um, and then I moved. Then where are we now? Three three years after that, I moved to Reading. So I'm massaging massaging away for three what years. Where did you go there then? Um, Millie's dad is from here, is from Reading. Okay. Um, I just fancied a fresh start. I just, yeah, just fresh start. New how do you find Reading? Um, how do I find it? Hmm. Yeah, I like it. I like, I'm in Caversham. I love Caversham and Henley Way. Reading is just, it's, it's a rough diamond, really, isn't it? It's, it's in the centre of the country. It's full of opportunity. Everyone's passing through all the time, making it exciting, forever changing. Yeah, I used to go to Reading quite a lot. Um, so uh, obviously coming from my part of the world, um, Reading is you know half an hour this side of London. So I used to quite often have meetings in a hotel, same hotel all the time in Reading. Um, because obviously it was it was um, you know maybe an hour and three quarters uh, to go to Reading. So um, and also um, one of our um, one of our most big cheesy p- people, Sam Clyde, comes from Spencer's Wood. Oh yeah, um, which is uh, as you know just outside Reading. So um, and of course we now have an office in Maidenhead, which isn't that far away from you. No, it's not at all. Ten or twelve or something. So. Um, so you've um, you 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 yourself have suffered from eczema. Or what what skin con- conditions have you have you? And that was congenital, was it? Or yeah, I was born with eczema, and it's just never gone away. It um, flares up now and again. But I gave exactly the same to my daughter. Um, she hugely suffers with it in the same place as I do. Head is arm knees. So how old was she when this started? You know, manifesting itself from birth. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, so it's quite a story, really. So it's, um, you know, I find it quite motivational to have someone. I could, now, obviously, you know, uh, one of the things I, I would have said, um, never having met you, that um, I always try to find out as much as I can about somebody before I interview them. Uh, and I would have said you were quite a private person. That's what I would have guessed. Is that true to say that? Yeah, personally, I don't really, I, I don't really um, air myself out there too much. Um, I, I, th- I think I'm actually, until you get to know me, I'm quite shy. So yeah, I my brain goes a bit blank. I don't really have a huge amount, you, you know, on so on Instagram and Facebook and stuff. I don't really have anything to update my status with every day. I I I don't find it real enough for me. You know, I mm. I need to speak and react rather than plan a post. So yeah, I, I'm not really much out there on, on the internet. Yeah, it's interesting that um, maybe we're the other separate conversation. Uh, I, I I think um, to some extent, you know, I think it's very important um, to be successful that you are yourself. You know, you're true to yourself. Yeah. I think I think you also have to accept that there, you know, that there is a sort of a game you have to play to some extent. Um, you know, and how you embrace that. Obviously, you can embrace that your own way. But um, yeah. uh, obviously, you know, social media, etc., is. You know, is incredibly important in this in this uh, in this world, and I suppose to some extent that makes your achievements um, even greater. You know, although um, of course I had no, you know, I think you've got it. There's, there's got to be a great book in you. You know, I'd like maybe I could write it. Uh, that'd be that'd be wonderful. Um, <laughs> I just imagine um, all the lovely pictures with the sausage and mash and and pies. Have a great so, um, Yeah. So. Um, 
Yeah, I, I just love the mindset of a of a mother. That's um, so one of the things that comes over from the very brief content out there is um, you know what actually inspired uh, the first business, which I think was called Moo Moo Soaps, um, was your feeling of guilt, maybe uh, your feeling of guilt that your daughter had, you know, was suffering from uh, a condition that you effectively had given her. Yeah. Um, and unlike most people, um, you you didn't just stop there. You didn't just sit there and wallow in self pity and sit there beating yourself up. You um, you said, right, you know, let's see if I can do something about that, which is an incredible thing to do. I think. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think I I felt like I had some skills to possibly help. So if I had some skills to possibly help, the least I can do is try. Um, I think that also moving to Reading, the difference in water, like it's a very, um, it's got a lot of chlorine, it's very hard water here. So yeah. it really affected our eczema a lot. What worse? Um, it was my choice to move here. Mm -hmm. So I felt like I had the skills to possibly help. So yeah, I got making soaps out of natural ingredients to hopefully stop aggravating at least the eczema. So I guess your aromatherapy background sort of helped you with that. Yeah. So how just sort of talk us through the mindset of someone like you. So how did you know where to start? Did you have, you know, do you think all oh, these ingredients there that they could be things to play with? You know, how did, how did you do it? Uh, well, I already had a load of aromatherapy oils because I always do. Um, I know they have healing properties to an extent. I mean, they're not ultra, ultra strong, but they um, they definitely are natural and they help. Um, but I didn't know how to make soap, so I did YouTube a lot. And then I went to um, a soap school. Um, Jodie and soap me went school. to soap <laughs> school. It was a weekend course um, <laughs> in London, and it gave us the basic tools we needed to get making some soap. And okay. then um, the actual soap it is today kind of developed. We were originally putting all sorts of colours in and trying to make all these Guinness soaps and watermelon soaps and... And then um, we decided to take all of that out and literally just put in what soap needed for it to be soap and to smell nice with natural essential oils. So what does soap need to be put in it to make it soap? It needs, like... um, it actually needs a, a caustic soda, which would dissolve a whole entire body if you submerged it in it. You know, have you ever seen Fight Club? Is it Fight Club? Mm -hmm. It's um... a really dangerous chemical. <laughs> Oh, does, does someone get dissolved in Fight Club, do they? Yeah, I think they, I've not seen it, but everyone says, oh, have you seen Fight Club? Because, yeah, you can dissolve people in, in caustic soda and water, which is what you need to make soap. If you haven't got that, you haven't got soap, which if, once the soap is cured, is no longer in the soap. So you are left with a very pure natural product. So did you, um, did you make your first samples at home, so to speak? Yeah, we, we made soap in our kitchen for the first four years. Yeah. It was a nightmare, but it was fun. In what sort of quantities? Just enough for a milli, really, or what? Uh, first of all, it was just little one kilo amounts, and then um, and then we started to make thirty three kilo batches, right. which started to become quite trying in the small kitchen. And you were selling these to other people on the on the market, so to speak. We were first of all just giving them out to friends and family and feeling oh, okay. smug because we've made soap. And then, um, and then we started to sell on to markets. Yeah, got bought ourselves a gazebo, a bit of insurance, and started selling on the markets. And it was very, it was very easy to set up. If people don't know market life and they've got a little bit of entrepreneurial spirit in them, they should definitely look at it. Such a supportive community. So easy to get into business that way. If you've got a bit of an idea, get a two hundred pound gazebo and crack on. So where did the where did the Moo Moo soaps come from? How what did how did you think of that? Um, it's. Millie Moo, my daughter is called Millie, we call her Millie Moo, so oh. it was Moo Moo Soaps because it was all based around her and trying to help her eczema. I mean, my, as you get older, you kind of grow out of it a bit, so other than the hard water affecting me when I was moving to Reading, it was more about Millie and her eczema and trying to not have her go through school life with the awful eczema that I had, which school can be a mean place when you're covered in eczema. For sure. So I think that's a good time to um, to have a, another break. Um, I'm not familiar with uh, the next artist you picked. It's called Lizzo. So what's um, what's the relevance of Lizzo to you? Uh, 
Um, it's on a series. It's a one of the tracks on a series, the L word, and it's just a great, great song. Oh, wait. Well, that was certainly uplifting, Claire. <laughs> of course, Drew was reminding me because um, the way the way um, our our um, our music system works, we've got I don't know several thousand track stores, and every time um, someone like you comes on, uh, that adds one to it. So I mean, at some point, uh, that'll be played again on one of my normal shows. So uh, yay! You've made a donation to the world there. Amazing. Yeah, so um, just make sure we get all this sort of running con top top contemporaneously. That's a good word, isn't it? Ooh. Contemporaneously. <laughs> um, so when did the cleaning company start? Was that before or after um, Moo Moo? The cleaning company came because of Moo Moo. So oh, okay. we, um, when you make soap and start making it on a larger quantity, you have waste because you, you can't sell every single bar. Some are underway or just a bit wobbly you know don't look great <laughs> so um i thought well i can't have all of this waste this isn't environmentally friendly um and i started to make cleaning products from the offcuts of the soap which is and then once we started to have a lot of cleaning product from all of this all these offcuts i thought well let's create a cleaning company that's environmentally friendly and only uses environmentally friendly products that we make um, and offer a service as well. So it, it all kind of ended up being a zero waste um, oh. situation. Oh, it ticks my boat. Um, box, uh, so it floats my boat even. Uh, mix. Boat I always was very good for mixing my metaphors. So there we are. <laughs> <laughs> I have to think about how to do a program <laughs> on mixing metaphors. Um, so you make cleaning products and you also provide a service. Is that right? Yes. Gosh. Yeah, in Caversham. So just a local. So it's quite a small business, is it? Yeah. Yeah, it just keeps a handful of people employed. They're fabulous. And people really appreciate the service because it's not... It's, you know, clean products we've made from offcuts of the soap that most of their customers already use. So they, they know exactly what's going in their home. And it smells of lovely essential oils as well, so rather than pine. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's probably a business concept that could be leveraged, isn't it? Yeah, I think there were a lot more... When I started this, it was 2017, um, and there wasn't that many eco or environmentally friendly cleaning companies. It was uh, cleaning companies are very popular, but now environmentally friendly cleaning companies or eco cleaning companies I see all over the place, which is fabulous. Whether they've been inspired by ours or come up with it themselves, it's just brilliant. I'm so pleased that there are more and more growing. I think if every cleaning company could be eco, it'd be brilliant. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago, I did a I did a feature on my news slot about zero waste shops. Um, so I think um, I think you may be the first person I've ever met in my business career, which is saying something. Um, <laughs> who who has a core business and they've um, utilised the waste products to to um, to create uh, a secondary business. And um, and of course, what's so wonderful about it is, um, as you say, it's um, you know it's sort of um, waste neutral. So, yeah. you know, as most of my clients would call it, a zero to landfill ambition. In, uh, in your case, it's just um, it's just avoiding. Um, so I don't know what, what, what would normally happen to uh, waste products of soap. Would they just get flushed down the toilet or something or, you know, that sort of thing? Or where do they go? Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe thrown away. I, I mean, we make washing powder out of ours. We make all sorts out of ours. But before that, we'd, because some of it, because it's, can be slithers so what can you really do with slithers you know oh. maybe push them together and make a bar of soap but that'd still come apart there wasn't really much you could do with it so That's yeah fabulous. yeah so um when did when did um it, your business sort of go from being a cottage industry to a proper commercial business would you say um, it's probably it about two years after doing markets. We because markets you can't travel that far oh, for I markets. See, yeah. So you're going to lots of local markets. So you're spreading yourself locally. Mm. So you're starting to get a bit of a following locally. And I think local saturation really helped. Rather than trying to focus on online sales and trying to compete with big companies nationally, mm -hmm. we saturated a local market, which then got lots of lovely orders. And it started. To, also, actually, I do know the moment. I got my calculations wrong and oh, okay. I made when you make soap you've got your recipe yeah um and you've got your 
water, your oil weight, and then you've got your end weight, mm -hmm. what you want to, how many kilos you want to end up with of soap. Well, I got those muddled and I ended up making 88 litres of charcoal soap in my kitchen mm -hmm. and I didn't have containers for this. And once your soap starts to thicken in the mixture process, you can't stop that. You've got seconds, maybe mm -hmm. a minute to pour it into its mould and let it set. And I had 88 litres of thick black charcoal soap starting to set in my kitchen, which was two metres long oh, maximum and one no. metre wide. And it was a mess. It was an absolute mess. And it was like, no more of this. We need to find somewhere to make soap. This oh, I see. Then. Yeah. So where, was, where's your soap made now? In Caversham, we've got a studio. Oh, okay. That's it, good. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's great. It's, it was a game changer for us. Not having to unpack and pack every time we wanted to make soap. We've just got a soap kitchen, storage, manufacturing, wrapping units. Lovely. So you don't you don't need any sort of particularly special equipment to make soap? No, gloves. Gloves and goggles because that stuff, really? while it's raw, is really, it burns. But other than that, no, mix a, a blender, bowls, mm. moulds. Okay, so I, I presume that to some extent your soaps are premium products. Yeah, I think because we only use um, olive oil, coconut oil, essential oils, and we're pretty careful about where they come from as well. Um, we don't, it's not necessarily any magic ingredient that goes in it. It's just what does go in it isn't a lot, but it's lovely. And it's not, I think the other thing is um, soap takes a long time to cure, but a lot of soap on shops shop shelves mm -hmm. they're they're made a week ago but they've got a load of chemicals in to harden them to make them harder quicker that's where we let our soaps cure for about six months to naturally get harder which is what makes them lovely so one of your skills is shown as being graphic design so where did you learn that and how does that apply to uh, your business um i my dad along with being henry uh, a jockey and working for henry cecil he's also a photographer um, so I learned a lot of Photoshop from my dad, um, which isn't, um, I'm not a, I'm not a complex graphic designer. I'm not a trained graphic designer. There's graphic designers out there with huge skills. I've just mm -hmm. got a good, I've got a good eye. I think I know what I want my packaging to look like and I can make it happen on um, Photoshop. I think if a graphic designer came along and looked at my work, they would be like, mm, this is, this is terrible, <laughs> but it works for our pr product. So when did um, when did the brand Nude come up? When did you th first think of that? Um, probably about a year after we started selling because a lot of people, okay. they would email us and say, I'm vegan, I nearly put this soap in the bin. You, you're called mm. Moomoo Soaps and I thought it was made out of cow's milk. Oh, I see, like, ah. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good, good point. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, we hadn't. <laughs> so where did, where did the inspiration for N-double-O-D come from? Um, well, I was just trying to think of cool, funky ways for us to figure out how to say we haven't got any not very nice stuff in our product. Um, and then I thought, well, it's, it's naked. Or it's, and then I come up with nude, but nude is always used, you know, N-U-D-E. That would already been trademarked. Mm. And so I come up with N-O-O-D. And also because it's it looks like Moo Moo with the double O's, so I could carry the logo over a little bit. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, I, I think it's, um, well, it certainly got my attention when I first looked at it. I thought, yeah, I, I probably did laugh a bit, actually, because I had very inappropriate. Um, <laughs> but um, I think, you know, after after careful thought, I mean, um, so when when did you or when did you become conscious or, or are you not even that you're growing and developing a brand? Is that obvious to you? It was the feedback from the customers when they say, I love your branding, I love your packaging. And we could, we knew there were rules. If we we're ever going to develop a product, there were mm -hmm. rules in place that just naturally happened. Like they can't have coloring. It can't have anything fake in it. Um, and then we could see the packaging with the colors starting to form a, a bit of a uniform. So it was like, actually, here's quite a strong brand. Also, okay. the word nude comes from strap line stuff for your birthday suit. So nude also worked well with that. Very good. So um, in the in the uh, nine minutes of talking time we have left, I think we'll. Um, so we've got Hey Soul Sister from uh, Train. 
Um, so what is this? I can just imagine you in uh, Tenerife jumping around to this. But um... This one is actually um, when me and Jodie first got together. She um, always imagined singing this to me in a karaoke bar. And she is not a public singer. She's a very good singer, but she'd never sings in front of anybody, even me. But she sung this to me, imagining that she was in a karaoke bar, letting everybody Lovely. know. So this dedicated to Jodie. Yes. Aspen, Aspen Weight Radio. Full weight. Oh, that was nice, wasn't it? <laughs> so we have eight minutes and 36 seconds left of, of Claire. Um, and I was thinking, I was just sort of thinking in my head about how I would sum up um, my view of you uh, in, in the time we've been talking. And I would say one of the things that came to mind is um, uh, probably in my media career, one of my breakthrough moments is when Alec from GB Expos let me talk about anything I wanted for the very first time as opposed to you know, to having to talk about a particular subject. Um, and uh, I'd just written a book, um, which was called basically Raising the Bar, Doing Business the Right Way. Uh, and I think that sums you up. Um, yeah. Yeah, doing business the right way. So I think, you know, your story proves that, um, well, firstly, you know, I think the uh, the motivation for your for your company coming out of love for your daughter is, um, is just a wonderful story. And, um, something I can relate to as well. And, um, you know, and the fact that um, you've, um, you've pursued that sort of, um, you know, that, that vision and, 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 and objective um, without ever sort of compromising on your standards, which is, um, I think, you know, a great testimony to you as a person. Uh, that's been a huge thing for me is do not compromise, never compromise. You can't compromise on you haven't got a brand if you compromise. It has to be natural at all times. And it's so easy to just take an easier route to wrap in plastic. It's an easier, it's easier. There's always an easier option. It's actually quite difficult um, to stick to your guns, especially when it comes to environmentally friendly, but there is always a way and it's the earth that costs. It's the earth that pays. So yeah, it's, it's been a big deal for us. Never compromise. So um, nude now, as, 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 as I was going to say to Drew, I wonder if anyone has ever said to Claire, um, founder of the nude group. <laughs> when we answer our phone in the studio, was it, hello, Claire, nude speaking or nude Claire speaking? You know, so, yeah, it's, it's I think nice. nude group is definitely the way forward. Um, <laughs> so now, of course, um, in terms of building a brand, which I think is incredibly important uh, and... Uh, one of the reasons, being serious for a minute, why I, um, I, 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 you know, I liked, um, you know, what I saw when I first saw your logo when you came up as a nominee uh, in one of the awards was, um, um, like, you know, my brand is everything to me. It's, it's, it's probably maybe the most important thing to me. Um, so, you know, I get very passionate about brand consistency and. Uh, particularly uh, inconsistency, you know. So it's very important to me that all aspects of Aspen Weight um, are tr are true to themselves. You know, you can't even the radio. So I remember sitting in a radio um, meeting, uh, and you know, a couple of my colleagues were talking about focusing on certain user groups, and I went nuts. You know, because to me, Aspen Weight is for everyone. You know, so you know, the minute you start compromising on on your values and yeah. you you have nothing left do you so um so um one thing i'm pleased to see uh so moo moo soups became uh nude and then um your cleaning company was rebranded as is that called nude cleaning it's nude at home even cheeky oh sorry nude at home sorry i i, I did know that so i've just failed my um <laughs> my master i just got 3 out of 10 on, on mastermind for my claire <laughs> anderson bell subject um yeah, I like, I'm nude at home is, is really good. Yeah, I suppose it's quite an obvious name to come up, isn't it? Yeah, um, and then for our, for, if we do commercial cleaning, it's nude at work. <laughs> actually, I've nude at work, nude at home. Yeah. And, and, and the cleaning company is a separate limited company, is it? Um, no, we've left it underneath the tax threshold at all times, just so because otherwise our customers have got to pay for that VAT, so it would make it a, um, it wouldn't make it a very um available service um so it's a partnership or something is it or a sole trader it's a partnership yeah again with jody yeah just as a by the by making it a limited company wouldn't mean you had to pay that on it does that of interest no i should make it a limited company and just leave it under the vat threshold yeah but um yeah. Oh, yeah, think... it's, 
Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something um, so some, something that um, obviously Claire is very proud of. Um, you opened uh, a shop in Caversham called Nude Stores. So tell yes. us all about that. Um, we did this only three weeks ago. Uh, we have Midra Plants in with us, um, who it, Jackie is the founder and she just creates and curates great, rare, amazing plants. And then we have F Word Flowers with us as well, who is a florist um, who just creates the most amazing bunch of flowers. And we have a great big dried flower cart in the shop. And both of those companies came together throughout lockdown. So okay. they're, they're lockdown birthed born companies and they have achieved so much in just a year and those two together in the shop it's just such a fabulous space we've got the eco refill station from all the products that we make from the offcuts of our soap then we've sorry what does that soap. mean it was what's an eco refill station so we've got big vats of washing up liquid all-purpose oh, okay. spray fabric softener and it's all from offcuts of our product again and people come in with their bottles and just fill them up and they're oh, just fine product rather than more packaging. Wow, it's almost like, you know, quite an old fashioned concept, isn't it? You know, it's sort of it like is. a Victorian store type thing. Yeah, a lot of people say, wow, this is so new. <laughs> Actually, it's very old. <laughs> well, you have to be old like me to realise it's old, you see. That's uh, <laughs> that's that's the problem, isn't it? If you're uh, uh, if you're if you're a youngster, then um, it probably seems quite um, it seems new. Know, qu quite hip and happening, you know. Uh, and of course, it's um, you now it's the same thing about these zero waste stores. You know, where you've got you've got these um, outlets with no packaging, yeah. Um, you know, minimal minimal um, shelving and this sort of thing. So yeah. it's all very you know, so all very sort of um, consistent with with what you're trying to do. So I love it. Yeah. Is there a is there a predominant color that you really like? Yeah, you know, that that sort of is 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 nude. The essence of nude, would you say? Um green green and pink okay yeah all different okay. shades of greens and pinks just that's so we need to get into suffragette colors don't we sorry yeah we need to get a, i actually like suffragette colors a lot i would have interest um i've got a tie actually looks like a suffragette tie but there we are <laughs> um it's very expensive uh but i had to buy it from singapore because it was the only only um one i could find <laughs> um so um, we've got, we got very long left so um what what um What's your aspiration for for Nude Group? You know, what um, are you are you an ambitious person? Are you someone who beats yourself up? Are you sitting there all the time? Come on, Claire, come on. You know, what is it? You know, what you a little bit. I think just feeling safe um, and not worrying and making mm -hmm. knowing that, that. <laughs> the business is okay is is good. Um, I'd like I'd like to open a few of these shops because they're just they're great. They've got some local little artisans mm. in and. I think it's exactly the sort of shop that smaller smaller towns should have. Um, so yeah, I think I mean Richard Branson says if people aren't laughing at your goals, they're not high enough. I don't know if I'm that hard, that that ambitious, but yeah, I do definitely want to feel comfortable and be able to make my people around me feel comfortable and safe. I don't think anyone would laugh at you. I think um, you know, I, th I think um, you know what you're doing is great. To be honest, yeah. um, it's um, yeah. You know, so I, I started off obviously not knowing this, but. Uh, uh, I said that I thought you would be inspirational, and I think you have been. And uh, uh, it's Thank always you. nice to talk to people that you can relate to, you know. And so, you know, you you use different words to me to describe how you feel, but they're essentially the same feelings, you know. <laughs> so, um, thank you for being such a wonderful guest today. Um, I do. Me. My head is full of ideas, genuinely, as a result of. Um, so, you, if, if you wouldn't mind talking to me after we finish the show today. Um, so thank you, Claire, for being such a wonderful guest. Um, you. Wish you all the best, and um, we will definitely talk again. So that was the Aspen Weight Radio Breakfast Show. It is Monday, August the 16th. Enjoy the rest of your day, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Online, on DAB, and on the Aspen Weight Radio app.